my text today is uh, is the book of Ephesians, the whole book, really. Uh, but we're going to uh, focus our attention in beginning in chapter four. And I want to begin reading at verse one. Here the apostle writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who was above all and through all and in you all. This is the word of the Lord. When a child is born in a hospital, the medical team will do an immediate assessment of the health of that child. I mean, obviously, they're going to check to ensure that this is a, a live birth. And they will not just check if the child is breathing and uh, has a heart rate. Those are the things that are most important at that moment. If that's not there, the child will be rushed away and there will be an attempt to resuscitate that child. But they will do an overall assessment. How are they breathing how do their lungs sound? How is the heart rate? What's their color like? Are there ten fingers and ten toes, etc.? And then, about ten minutes later or fifteen minutes later, at least in the U.S., there is another test. The same test is repeated, and they are given a score. It's called the APGAR score in the U.S., and uh, color on a one to ten scale, and uh, breathing on a one to ten scale, and compare the immediate and then the one ten minutes later and then they will make a declaration about the health of that child. Throughout the life of that child, as they go on to teenage years and then on to adulthood, certain parts of those tests are going to be done over and over and over and over again. So that if they're 80 years old and they go to see the doctor, they're going to listen to their lungs, they're going to listen to their heart, they're going to check their skin, they're going to look into their eyes and look in their ears and look down their throat. They're going to do some of those essential tests over and over again, fundamental things to determine their health. There are marks of good health. And just as that is the case medically and physically, so it is the case spiritually. When a child of God is born... There are fundamental signs you look for to determine, is this a live birth? Is this the real thing? Is this the work of the Spirit of God in bringing someone from darkness to light, from death and sins and trespasses to life in Christ? And so you listen. Are there things like faith in Jesus Christ? Is this person looking to Christ? Do they have a fundamental understanding of what God has done for them in the gospel? And then you wait, and you watch, and you ask, are there things like a hunger for God's word? Is there an attachment to the body of Christ? Is there a growing love for the things of God and the things of eternity for the people of God? Is there a growing a uh, distance from the old life and patterns of sin. These are the things that you look at in order to determine, is this a healthy, living child of God? And it, it's something of that framework that I want to consider the truths from God's Word today. We're looking at this matter, and I think as Troy put it, of housework. Christian men and housework. Now, I'm sure you, you, I don't know if you use the expression over here that we do. So if you're a married man, they say every married man, if they have a day off, their wife has a honey-do list. Honey-do this, honey-do that, honey-do, you know, so the honey-do list. And you may have thought to yourself, all right, what's he going to, it's just going to be a very practical message about men being involved in housework. Well, the house that is being considered is the house of God. 
And the work is the work of Christian men in the house of God. And as I understand that, and as I heard that, and as Troy and I talked about that a little bit, I recognize that a, a man's life in the house of God is one of the great indicators of spiritual life and of spiritual health and vigor. And so as we consider that, I want to begin by looking at what I'm going to call, very briefly, a gracious foundation. And then we're going to consider together a gracious outworking a gracious foundation. And it's found here in these words of the apostle in chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore, and the word therefore, uh, I have, I've made the argument at times, and I, I guess I mean this, I say it somewhat, not, not really tongue in cheek, but I, it's a, uh, I say it sometimes to arrest people's attention that the most important word in the Bible is therefore. It's the single most important word. And what I want to encourage all of us as you look at a therefore is that you live knowledgeably and really on both sides of the therefore. Now the therefore indicates that there, there are presuppositions and truths that need to be known and that those presuppositions and truths will impact our life. Jesus died, therefore. Jesus laid down his life, therefore. Jesus is gracious to you. Therefore, there are the practical outworkings. And for some people in Christianity, they want to live on one side of the therefore. That is, they're very doctrinal. They love theology. Uh, they know truth. You visit their house, so they've got theology books. They listen to good preaching. But their lives are a mess. And then there are other Christians who like to live on the other side of the therefore, and that is they're all about practical Christianity. Just tell me what to do. Tell me five steps to being a good husband, 15 steps to being a good dad, three steps to being a successful Christian worker, whatever it is. I want to have a moral life. I want to have a good life. I want to live a life that uh, people look at and that they admire. He's a great guy. He's a great worker. He's a good provider. He's a good husband. He's a good dad. He's moral, whatever. And sometimes that can be detached from the first side of the therefore. That is, it's not attached to new life in Christ. It's not attached to dependence on the Holy Spirit. It's not an, a practical outworking of the doctrine of God's grace. It's grit and spit and determination. It's almost a look at me, not look at the work of God in me, rooted in a new life in Christ. And the foundation of what Paul says when he says, I therefore, is everything that he said in beginning at chapter 1 and going through to the end of chapter 3. Now, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that you have some acquaintance or awareness with the book of Ephesians. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to read every text. I'm going to allude to certain texts. But if you had to summarize, what are the great truths and the great doctrines contained in Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3? And uh, if I had to boil it down to two, and I am going to boil it down to two, I want to say that there are two things that are at work here in these opening verses. The first is the wonder of God's gracious dealings with us individually. And the second is the wonder of God's gracious dealings with us corporately. So chapter 1 begins with this wonderful depiction of the sovereignty of God. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And he works all of that wonderful truth out, what we uh, refer to at times as the Reformed faith and the sovereignty of God. If I were doing a, 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 a series on the sovereignty of God and salvation... You, you better believe Romans 8 would be one of my attacks in the book of Ephesians, which Ephesians 1 and 2 would be my other great text that I would look at. If I wanted to preach to you about that, the fact that salvation is by grace 
by faith apart from the works of the law, I'd use Romans and I would use Ephesians. So the, the great text, if I were to say to you, prove to me in the Bible that salvation is by grace through faith and not by works, you'd quote, would you not, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, but you were dead in your sins and in your trespasses, and he has made you alive who were dead. And you look at those texts and you point to it and you say, brethren, in light of this and other passages in God's word, salvation is the result of God's sovereign, effectual, gracious work, that it is wholly, wholly dependent upon God's work, what God has done for us in Christ, apart from anything that we do, that we have our standing and how gracious God is. We were, yes, dead, but we were like the living dead. We were like the walking dead. We were walking and living under the power of the principalities of darkness. The prince of the power of the air was at work in us, but God, but God intervened and God did a gracious work. And having spoken of that work done in us individually, a work that is supernatural, loving, merciful, light from death, an apprehension of what it means to be united by faith in Christ, a life by which the child of God individually is amazed by grace. He understands how God has dealt with him and how God deals with him now. God deals with us according to our union with Christ. God continues to deal with us in a gracious and in a merciful way. And so Paul's going to say, in light of all that, therefore... But that's not the only truth that Paul deals with in Ephesians 1 through 3. Beginning in chapter 2, he begins to deal with this wonderful reality that our new life in Christ is a life that places us in union not only with Christ, but in union with Christ's body. And he begins to unfold the wonderful truths of the doctrine of the church so that if I had to preach a series of messages on the church and I had only one book in the Bible to preach on the doctrine of the church, I'd use the book of Ephesians. Because Paul here deals with this, again, wonderful reality, this incredible, gracious thing that God does in uniting a people not only to himself, but to one another. And so it's in the book of Ephesians that Paul is particularly keen to use this wonderful example of how God draws Jews and Gentiles to himself in Christ. Now, perhaps in our context that doesn't amaze you. We're so used to hearing that, yeah, Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles. Well, in some places, uh, if I were addressing, a, like I am here, a, a largely white uh, group of Australians, and I brought up the <coughs> aboriginal situation, and I said, listen, I know a congregation where there are the Aussiest Aussies you'd ever know, and there are the most aboriginal aborigine that you would know, and oh, how they love each other, how they get along with each other, how they labor together. In some places, I, I'm, I'm assuming that might be surprising or that might gain people's attention. So in my country, I would say deep south, kind of people that drive around with a confederate flag, you know what that is, uh, on their pickup truck and their gun rack. And if you saw somebody like that driving and you saw beside him a black brother and saw the two of them get out of that truck and embrace one another as they entered into the house of God, that would have the attention of certain people. If you went over to the Middle East and you saw Jews and Arabs, Palestinians and Jews, entering the same house of worship, arm in arm, loving one another, you would say, God is doing something here. It's not just that God loves Palestinians, and they have a Palestinian church, and God loves Jews, and they have a Jewish church, and God loves white people, so there's a white church, and God loves blacks, and there's a black church, or that God loves Asians, and there's an Asian church. No, it's all together 
in one body, united in Christ, and therefore united together in one. And so Paul says, using the imagery of the old temple, that the wall, the wall of partition, and back in the ancient times, in the Jewish temple, there were uh, walls and there were gates and there were places, women were over here, men were over here, Jewish men there, Gentiles who had an interest in the God of Israel, they were separated. They weren't allowed to have full access unless they went all the way with Jewish conversion, circumcision, and, and all the rest. And what Paul says, what God has done in Christ, he's knocked down that wall. And he has made the two one new man in Christ. And he begins to exalt in the glory of what God is doing in the church. And so our brother Andrew and our brother Troy at the family camp both turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and dealing with the wonder of what God does in answer to prayer. Opened up these words. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory. Now, if you're reformed, and you know what that means, you care about the glory of God. I mean, there's no more fundamental mark of a reformed person than an almost obsession with the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Soli Deo Gloria. We love the glory of God. But he says, let this glory be in the church, not just the individual Christian, not just in their family life, not just in their work life, not just in their personal pursuit of holiness, but that God would receive glory in the church, in the gathered church. And what does church mean? Well, church means a gathering. Church means an assembly. And so in order to be a part of that, you need to assemble together with the people of God, people who are different from you in many ways, but who have had a common experience of the grace of God. And Paul says, that's the foundation of what I'm going to say. Now, I'm going to apply this, right? I'm going to, I'm going to give exhortations to you as those who have received the grace of God individually and are now experiencing the grace of God together corporately. Because God is going to evidence his saving grace and his saving power in a very particular way as men and women gather together in the assembly of his people. It's one thing to try, strive to be a gracious, loving, consistent Christian man living in isolation. It's quite another for you to do it in a body. There's an old joke, I don't know, you, you may have heard it about the man on a desert island who, Christian man, have you heard this story? Christian man on a desert island, he's there for years, and somebody finally comes to rescue him, and he shows around the island, these are the buildings I built, and the guy says, what's that over there? He says, oh, that's my church. And they say, what's that building over there? He said, oh, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> yeah, so he... Even on the island, he somehow offended, got offended at church. You know, but the, the idea there is that, yeah, that's too often the case, right? Well, I couldn't live together. I couldn't live together with those people. So now I have to try to move myself over here. And Paul is saying that you need to understand that when you are united to Christ, he doesn't just deal with you individually. He begins to deal with you corporately. He unites you to something greater than yourself, which is why he's going to use the expressions of things like a temple. He's going to use the illustration of a body. He's going to use the illustration of a family in order that we would understand that whatever the grace of God is doing, it is not merely doing a work in me alone that God places us as he would a stone in a temple. Peter picks up on that imagery as living stones gathering together to form this spiritual house. He does that as a stone in a temple. He's going to use the illustration as a member of a body in which the body works together in order that that body might grow, again, not just individually, but corporately. There's the image of sheep 
in a flock, of a child or brother in a family, a husband and wife, all of that imagery is used. Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body, he says. And then he then uses this very striking language, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, those are the kinds of words you hear, and you just kind of, it's, it's like staring at the Grand Canyon. You just kind of go, wow. You know, somebody tries to explain to you, it's this deep and it's this wide, but your response is, wow. Or you look out on certain starry nights, and somebody says, now, do you know that star is however many light years away? And, and, but really what you're thinking is, wow. So if I were to say to you that Jesus fills everything in the world, all things have been placed under the feet of of the risen Christ. God has exalted him above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he has set him as head of the church. And then he says, which is his body. The body of whom? The body of that one who is exalted above all, the one who fills all in all. And he says, and that body is his fullness. That is the fullness of who and what he is is seen not so much in the Christian individually as in the Christians corporately. That there is a dynamic of the work of Christ and the power of Christ and the fullness of who Jesus is and his saving identity and his glorious person that is seen in the corporate gatherings of God's people. That's Paul's argument. All right. The church shows, he's going to say in this, his wisdom, his power, his grace, his kindness. And he uses again this composition of the church, Jews and Gentiles, male and female, slave and free, as you work your way throughout the book to showcase his glory. He loves the church. He gave himself for the church, denied himself in love. And so my premise as I begin is, that that same love and attachment and self-denying service that marks the heart and mind of Jesus Christ toward his body should be what marks us as his people as well. That we should not only glory in God's grace to us individually, we should look to see his grace corporately. Okay? So I say that because we do live uh, at a time in which uh, so many and perhaps far too many uh, focus on grace individually and don't see the beauty of grace corporately. But I want to argue here that if we're going to be the men who are what God calls us to be, it's going to demonstrate itself in our gatherings and in our heart toward one another. And so let's look at this gracious outworking. And I have six things very quickly that I want to, that I want to deal with. And the first is that if we would... If we would understand the work of God in us individually and understand the plan of God corporately, that there will be, first of all, and this is chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, I've already read this, a loving, humble, purposefully unifying walk with God's people. A loving, humble, purposefully unifying walk with God's people. So that's fairly clear, isn't it? When we gather together, there is ever and always the uh, opportunity to be offended, to be hurt, to be wounded, and that hurt and those wounds tend, left unhindered, to build walls. So I, I use the expression at the conference this last week, Satan is all about walls and wedges. Satan builds walls, Satan drives wedges. Tries to do that in your home, tries to do that in your relationships with your friends, and, he's, and he will try to do that in your corporate life. That somebody, somewhere or other, it's, it's, it is, it's going to happen. You cannot get people together for long without their being hurt. I tell new people that visit our church, and when they visit our church, they often really, really like our church. And they, they love the ministry, and they're amazed by, oh, people here are so this, that, and the other, and I ask before they join, I say, have you been offended yet? I said, you're not ready to join until you've been offended. You're not ready to join until you've, di you've been disappointed. 
and, and I want to see how you handle that hurt and that disappointment. Are you able to recognize and realize that your elders are not perfect? That your elders are human and they make mistakes and sometimes they, they're not trying to hurt you? They're, they're, you know, they're not like, mm, how can I offend this person? They don't ever do that. They're not trying to think of, uh, how can I say the stupidest thing I can publicly to drive the biggest wedge possible? It's not what they're trying to do. But they are human. Uh, I've lived with Troy here for a few days. Yeah, so he's human. I'm human. Uh, we, are, we are frail men. We don't always know what to do. And that's going to happen. And it's going to happen with elders. It's going to happen with deacons. It's going to happen with fellow members. And so Paul says you need to remember when you're tempted to put up walls and wedges that God has dealt with you graciously. What if God dealt with you the way your heart is now dealing with your brother or sister? They hurt me. I'm going to meditate on that. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to bring it up. If, is, that how God, is that how God has dealt with you? And you say to yourself, well, no way. If that were the case, I'd be doomed. I'd go to hell. If God dealt with me the way I'm tempted, and he goes, all right, therefore... Do you remember when you were dead in your sins and trespasses? Do you remember that you did nothing to contribute to the love of God? Do you remember that God loves you regardless of who and what you are? Do you remember that God overlooked your past sins and forgives your present sins? Do you remember that? Well, then go and do likewise. And as you're tempted then to put these walls and wedges up, remember what this group of people are. They're the body of Christ. They're loved by him. He gave his life for them. He laid down himself for them. Therefore, I will have a lowliness of mind, that is, I consider who I am. There will be a gentleness and a long suffering. There will be a bearing with one another in love. And there will be an endeavoring, an endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So you know what an endeavoring is. Well, let me just say this. I'll give a negative. It's not passivity. It's not merely waiting for, well, so-and-so wounded me, and, and therefore uh, I'll try to be good about it, and I'll passively wait. No, it is an active pursuit of unity. So that if one of you were uh, at, at work and there was some heavy machinery there, and let's say something came down and it cut your arm off. Would you think to yourself, well, it'd be wonderful if that were healed one day. And you know what you, you would think to yourself immediately, is there a possibility to reattach that? And you would pack it in ice and you would get the most immediate medical attention possible and you would undergo the grueling process of healing and physical therapy in order to have that back, wouldn't you? Well, we are members one of another. And there is a, a jealous, zealous guarding of that unity. If we are to do work in God's house, there needs to be a humility about us. Not so easily offended. We're a lowliness. Do you know, as Christians, we confess the worst things possible about ourselves? But sometimes we do this only theoretically and theologically, and, and you wonder, do you really believe it? So what, and what we say about ourselves theologically is, this is, is, how many of you have ever used the expression, if I got what I deserved, I'd go to hell? You ever, you ever use that expression? Do you, do you live and act as though that's true? So that when somebody offends you, you know, see, so we have this, oh, I'm the lowliest. Nobody's more lowly than me. Hey, I think you're a jerk. What do you mean? I'm not a jerk. I'm great. You know, that's how we actually respond. Well, I thought you just said you were a lowly, sinful. Yeah, I don't really mean that. I'm just being theological. Now, it needs to get out of the realm of theological and theoretical and into the realm of our daily living. That's what allows us to be long-suffering is because we don't view ourselves as anything. We've emptied, Christ emptied himself. We have an emptying of ourselves. He, he emptied himself of what one, heard one preacher called the insignias of majesty. 
He emptied himself of that right to be worshipped and adored for a time by all the created order, allowed himself to be beaten and mocked and blasphemed, and he was silent before that. And he says, go and be likewise. So a loving, humble, purposeful, unifying walk. Secondly, there is in the house, the work of a house, an embrace of the means provided for our growth. And that's seen in verses 7 through 16 here of Ephesians chapter 4. The ascended Christ gives gifts for the church. And we read in verse 11, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we're no longer going to be children tossed to and fro, driven about by every wind and wave of doctrine, etc., etc. You're familiar with that text. So he's saying, do you want to grow? Do you want to grow? You want to know the truth? You want to be schooled in the truth? He says, well, that's going to happen. You'll read the text as you gather together and take your part, but that you do so benefiting from the means that God has given. So in the past, some apostles, prophets, and evangelists, and in the present, throughout the church age, pastors and teachers. And so what I want to encourage, and I don't know if this is an issue here, but it's something that I would encourage. It's, it's the case uh, in the U.S. that there tends to be, uh, among far too many professing Christians, kind of what is the least possible commitment that I can have to the gathered church? And really the, the, answer, the question in that is, well, how much do you want to grow? Well, I want to grow. I just don't want to grow under the ministry of pastors and teachers, which are God's primary means of helping us that we might have, that I might be equipped for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. And what I want to encourage here, brethren, is that if we're going to be the church, we're going to be a part of a church, and understand that being a part of a church means that we gather. Well, that's what church means. A church is a gathering. It's an, a, it's an assembly. And a purposeful assembly in which somebody, your pastor or somebody, has labored to provide food for you and then a loving pastoral relationship. They're providing that food for you and they're doing it not generically for a Christian audience out there somewhere. They're doing it for you. They're actually, they, they are cooking their meals not as a chef behind a wall in a restaurant but far more like a wife and mom in the home who when she's cooking is thinking about the needs and the health uh, of the family for whom she's cooking. And that's the way a pastor prepares their sermon. They, they take you, the people of God, the, the children of God, they take you into their heart and into, your, into their study and they are praying that the Lord will use this word to edify and to grow you. And just as, and you're going to feel this more, as you, if, you know, so some of you men, you're going to get this more than you younger men. When you know your wife has worked hard and cooked long, and the kid comes home and says, oh, I grabbed macas on the way home. And you're like, boy, I want to, you know, no, I'm not really going to, but like, do you know what your mother did? No, I'm not really hungry. I've already, I've already fed. No, uh, we're going to go, we're going to go out and go see a movie. No, you, your mother labored for hours. And it's a sad reality sometimes for a pastor that he will labor hard in the word and doctrine and have certain people very much upon his heart that so-and-so needs this comfort. So-and-so needs this challenge, and I, and I know them well enough, and I know this passage is well-suited to their need, and, and not because they're medically unable or because they're on vacation, but simply because they decided there's something else they wanted to do than be in God's house. 
that, 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 that can break the heart of a man of God who is laboring for your good. Embrace the means provided for your growth. And then thirdly, a, a man doing the housework in the church. So he's committed to lovingly and humbly and purposefully pursuing a unifying walk among the people of God. He's embracing the means that God has provided for his growth. Thirdly, they're fighting their sin. And you know, that chapter 4, verse 17 through to chapter 5, 14. He's going to deal with a whole host of things that describe what our new life in Christ is like. This I say, verse 17 of chapter 4, Therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and are renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, he said, putting away lying. He's going to talk about that. He's going to deal with laziness and with labor and working hard so that you have enough to provide for your family and share with those in need. He's going to talk about anger and bitterness and clamor and evil speaking and not letting the sun go down on your anger. Yeah, be, be angry, but do not sin. He's going to talk about sexual cleanness in chapter 5. It's going to remind us that those things that society laughs at and mocks at, uh, monogamy and visual and heart purity. It's going to remind us that in a sex-saturated society that those societies are subject to the coming wrath of God and we must not be deceived. God's not going to be mocked in this. God is the God who designed our bodies and designed marriage and he is the king who has given to us laws that must be kept and obeyed and those laws are obeyed inwardly and mentally and outwardly with our bodies. And what I'm saying here, brothers, is that one of the greatest gifts you can give to the body of Christ is your own zealous pursuit of purity. To the degree that we are morally compromising, to that degree we risk grieving the Holy Spirit, to that degree we risk the removal of God's blessing upon us. And let's be honest, brethren, we don't, you don't have and I don't have the money or the machinery to allow our churches to go on without the blessing of God on them. That's really, in the end, all you've got. You, you, there's nothing impressive about us. There's nothing impressive about our building that's going to draw, ooh, I want to go in that building. Oh, I want to go listen to that music. Oh, you know, we're not gifted enough. We don't have enough programs. We don't have enough anything to draw or keep people other than the blessing and the presence of God. And the prophet Isaiah said, the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah, the the arm of the Lord is not shortened so that it cannot save, nor is the ear of the Lord, Lord dull that he cannot hear, but your sins have placed a barrier between us. And the exhortation is meant if there are areas of your life right now in which you know you are compromising, in which you are excusing patterns of sin, and you're not fighting, and you're not forsaking, and you're not repenting. I'm not saying you never fail. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, brother, I, I'm a guy. I get it. I understand. I'm in the fight. I have an old, broken-down body, and my mind can at times be a cesspool. But it's what do you do when it's there? What do you do when your mind's in the gutter? What do you do when you find yourself tempted with thoughts about whatever it is, lying, cheating, anger, lust, whatever it might be, and you're more like the old man than the new. And it's like you're putting on that old thing that you threw out long ago, like some man might have done in days gone by, back when you 
You used to have to buy dirty magazines. Couldn't just get things on the internet. And I've seen guys, literally I've seen this. Guy gets it, feels gross after he's done it, he throws it into a garbage bin, and hours later he's digging through the garbage to get it back. Peter describes it as a dog returning to its vomit. That's a, that's a disgusting picture, isn't it? I mean, isn't that the, how, gret, how gross is that? That a man might throw up and then later on look at it and go, hmm, I'd like to have that back in my belly. You say, no, what man would do that? But that's what, that's what our hearts do. And brethren, if we would do heart work, we will humbly, lovingly, patiently, purposely pursue a unifying walk with God's people we will embrace the means provided for our growth. We will fight our sin. Fourthly, we will take in the word and the spirit. And that is what I'm going to call intake and dependence. And that's found in chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. He says there, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now what... How in the world are you going to understand? How do we understand? How do we walk wisely? How do we understand what the will of the Lord is? That's going to be through our intake of God's word, isn't it? It's going to be embracing publicly the means that God has appointed. Teachers, pastors, preaching the truth of God systematically, going through portions of God's word so you grow in understanding. But also, brethren, we have, what a, what a wonderful time in which we live. We if you could take the whole of church history, and, and we have one of our Presbyterian brethren here, so we'll say church history starts with, with Israel. Covenant people of God. With the covenant people of God, if we, if we want to say that, old, the old covenant church and new covenant church, however you want to break it down. So for 4,000 or 2,000 years, most of God's people had very, very limited access to the Word of God. If you lived in, in, in 1,200 years, B.C. or 1200 uh, A.D., and you said to a Christian, let's read the book of Ephesians together. Well, not well. Or Let's read Leviticus together. Let's read Deuteronomy together, or let's read Ephesians together. It's a, I wish I could, but I have no access to God's word. I have no access to the scrolls and to the writing. You know, we, we've got it on our phones, don't we? Uh, we have paper copies, electronic copies. I have audio copies of God's Word. We have all of this wonderful, easy, ready access and a multitude of translations, easy to read. But brethren, we're not going to walk in wisdom if we don't pick it up and we don't take it in. But then he not only says to walk in wisdom and understand the will of the Lord, but he says also, and do not be drunk with wine and which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things in the, uh, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. He said you're going to need to be filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit, and I'll notice here that some of that works itself out in corporate worship. Spirit-filled people worship corporately. Spirit-filled people are dependent on the Holy Spirit. So part of that means they not only worship, but note also they give thanks. That is, they're part of prayer. And they're not just giving thanks individually, they're giving thanks corporately. So let me give, I'm going to give an exhortation, and, and nobody asked me to do this, and I didn't talk, I may, I may horribly embarrass, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but let me give you an exhortation based upon being at your prayer meeting uh, last Saturday and Sunday. And my exhortation is, first of all, that you come to times of prayer, if you can. Make it a priority to be there to pray. But come, brothers, ready to pray. Come expecting to pray. Come if you need to, if you know, like, we're going to have a season of thanksgiving, if I need to even write it out ahead of time, but that I come not just waiting and waiting and waiting for someone. So we, we have, these, we have a men, these men in our American history that are called the Minutemen. You ever heard about the Minutemen? Anybody ever heard about the Minutemen? Oh, I'll give you a little bit of American history. 
All right, so the colonial army, the army that fought England for our independence, uh, was made up largely of farmers and, uh, and just laborers and things like that. And so they had an expression that if the alarm went out, they had to be ready at a minute's notice. So they were the minute men. They had to, their guns were ready. Their clothes were ready. So like firemen. Firemen sometimes will have their clothing laid out in a way I don't know if it's the same way here as it is in the U.S., but they're able, they get out of bed if they're sleeping at the fire station. Their boots and their trousers are all together. They stick their feet in, pull their trousers up, pull their suspenders on, pull their jacket on, go down the pole, and they're ready and in the truck in, in a minute. And the point is, they don't need five or 10 or 15 minutes to think, well, no, they, 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 you're there ready to fight a fire. You're there ready to fight a battle. And so I just encourage you, come ready to pray. Come expecting to pray. Come prepared to pray. So that if a pastor says, now who will lead us in thanksgiving to God, that there's not 45 seconds of silence or a minute of silence, that you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to do it. And you're thinking, oh, I'm, going to, I'm going to do it. And far better to have three men, and we do this at our church sometimes, three men start to pray at one time. And then finally, one, some, I don't know how it all works out, one man prevails, you know. So <laughs> you hear three men, our Father in heaven, and then one drops out, and then finally one's like, oh, I won, you know. So, <laughs> But the point is, there, and as soon as one is done, another's ready to pray. And then another's ready to pray, and another's ready to pray. And you may have a briefer prayer meeting as a result of that, but you're ready. So just a, a, a word of encouragement, a word of exhortation. Lord, I'm coming here tonight to pray, and I want to lead my brothers and sisters. I want my heart prepared. I want to think through what we're going to pray about, and I want to participate. And maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not what we call them seasons of prayer. So our first season of prayer in our prayer meeting is praise and thanksgiving. And then we'll often pray for missions or other churches, and then we pray for the preaching of God's word, and then we pray for our body life together and, and, and personal needs. But you're, you're thinking to yourself ahead of time, all right, here I am. I'm taking in God's word. We're depending on the spirit. The work of the spirit empowers me inwardly. It works itself out in corporate prayer, singing, prayers of thanksgiving and dependence. Fifthly, I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm sorry, I realize I'm going very long here. An embrace of biblical family life. Chapter 5, 22 to 610. And that is that one of the great gifts you can give to the corporate assembly of God's people, brothers, is your, who are married, loving your wife. Loving your wife and being actively involved in the rearing of your children. That you love your kids. You're not ashamed to speak the word of God to them. You, you, you're avoiding what he says here. Don't provoke your children to wrath, dads. But dads, you're involved. You're leading your family, loving your wife. And then finally... This is the sixth thing, a determination to fight. And that's chapter 6, verse 11, through to the end. That is that we're taking up the armor of God, that we are involved in fight with our, the fight with our enemy. So then what are we called to? This is the book of Ephesians, a life rooted in the grace of God, rooted in an understanding of our union with Christ, which means our union with his body that works itself out graciously in a loving, humble, purposeful, unifying walk, an embrace of the means provided for our growth, fighting our sin, taking in the word, depending upon the spirit individually and corporately, an embrace of godly family life and a determination to fight the enemy with the weapons that God has given to you. And is that a perfect church? Well, you know what? Uh, there is no perfect church. I always, always tell people when they say, well, this church isn't good enough. Well, yeah, it may be. Uh, hopefully it's good enough for the Lord and that he hasn't given up on us yet. But I say to some people sometimes, now, I do, know, I do know a perfect church, but I'd have to kill you to get you there. You see, we Americans are so violent, right? <laughs> um, there is a perfect church, but that perfect church exists above. And we are part of the church right now, imperfect, but striving. And men, may you strive with your leaders, 
May you strive together for the kind of church life that is rooted in this therefore, rooted in new life in Christ, rooted in the knowledge of God's love for the church, rooted in the practical application of the grace of God. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments together in your word, and we do pray that uh, we might embrace these things from the heart uh, that you might give to us, Heavenly Father, wisdom and insight and the help and aid of the Spirit of God to see this worked out. It's in your Son's name we pray.